Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist, DT, the commander of chaos, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe. Let's talk about this week in weather, and man, do we have a lot to talk about. So let's get right to it. This pattern is turning colder and nastier. And I think we're going to be off to a pretty early start to the winter, but let's see how it's shaping up. First, let me remind you, here's the website. We offer a lot of different products for winter. If you're a snow guy, if you're, you know, landscapers, if you uh, have other snow issues here. So we have a lot to offer you. So uh, get a chance to take a look at the website. Also, don't forget the three-week newsletter down there at the bottom, only $5 a month, gives you information for the next three weeks. And again, it's not computer generated. A lot of that stuff you sign up for on these websites is all computer generated. No, 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 I, I do the forecast here. Um, so just to let you know it's not computer generated GFS nonsense. All right, uh, earlier in the week uh, on the uh, Twitter page and on the Facebook page, I showed you these maps here. These are from the Monday night, Tuesday morning extended weather models from the GFS on the left, the European on the right. So both of these models were in pretty good agreement. Now, usually when you go out, you know, 10, 12 days, 15 days, 20 days, these extended models are all over the place, but that's not the case here. So this one is for November 10th, and you can see both models have a moderate-sized trough on the East Coast. They both have some blocking in Northern Canada and a moderate ridge on the West Coast. So that's a possibility of some sort of cold front or, or coastal low or Eastern US low there on November 10th. Then here you are November 20th. Again, the GFS and the European. The GFS has a bigger trough than the European, but the European's colder. And both models have strong blocking in Baffin Island and in Greenland by November 20th. And then even by the uh, going into, towards Thanksgiving, both models are pretty darn cold. That's a pretty big ridge on the West Coast, folks, almost into Alaska and the Arctic region. You're getting some cross polar flow showing up here. Strong blocking in the Baffin Island and Greenland and a moderate sized trough on the East Coast. Maybe some, uh, you know, Thanksgiving mountain snows, you know, in the Appalachians, that sort of stuff. So uh, getting cold and padded, there's no doubt about it. So this warm sh crap we've been seeing here for September and October late September, that's gone. Now, this was the upper air map back on uh, October 6th. And we can see the strong block. But notice where the block is. It's just north of Minnesota in uh, Manitoba, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, western Ontario. And we have the big trough on uh, over the west coast, you know, British Columbia, down off the coast of California, bringing the moisture in. So this was started the, the really wet pattern here for the west coast and the Rockies, and they really, really need it. So this was good for them, but it's a mild pattern for the eastern United, central United States, and it has been. Now the pattern began to change, like we said, after October 15th. Notice what happens here. That block is now migrated way to the north. You see how it shifted up towards Hudson's Bay, Canada? Now that allows a moderate trough to develop an upper low and a trough across the Great Lakes and New England, bringing in somewhat seasonally cooler air. And as a result, if you've noticed since October 15th, October 17th, we've had a lot more days uh, staying in the 60s and low 70s and a lot of nights uh, upper 30s low to mid 40s depending on where you are meanwhile the trough in the eastern pacific from the gulf of alaska is still slamming uh the west coast with these monster storms as we've been seeing in the media and the coverage lately huge ocean lows very intense 945 950 millibars like like hurricanes like category three hurricanes and then bring in the moisture in. Now what's happening is this energy, instead of going from Oregon to Minnesota, is being forced to go underneath the block. And that's what set up the nor'easter uh, yesterday, the day before, and this next system coming up. So here's the next system. You see what happens? This piece of energy coming in here to Oregon is forced to track underneath it. And now here is the upper air map for October 28th this morning. And we can see this monster trough here with an upper low and a surface low developing over Texas and Arkansas. Now off in New England, we still have our, our nor'easter. But what's happening is because the nor'easter is still there, this system cannot move to the coast. And on top of that, we have the huge block. Look at that monster block now over northern Quebec, Canada, up to Baffin Island. So this upper low coming out of Arkansas, Louisiana, is going to be forced to crawl slowly northward and wait for these other two systems to get the hell out of the way. 
And as a result, we're looking at a prolonged event. So here it is now, October 29th to 30th. The upper low is closed off completely over the Tennessee Valley. But look at the main jet stream. You see how the main jet stream is to the north? So not only is this an upper low, this is what we call a closed cut off upper low. It is separated from the main jet stream. And it's going to hang around for several days. Eventually, by October 31, Halloween, the system is in New York State and Pennsylvania. The trough is still there, but there's another trough coming down from western Canada into the upper plains, slowly pushing the system to the east. Now, here's our latest surface map, and it's impressive. Let me see if I can blow this up for you a little bit, and you can see a little bit here. There's the low over a very strong low for this time of year, 992 over southern Missouri. That's not a coastal low. That's in the middle part of the country. And you can see the occluded front. That's the purple line there. And then we have our cold front, and then the warm front along Florida. Meanwhile, we have the big high over Quebec, Canada, and then you can see the, the ocean low leaving the eastern coast of New England. So that low in Missouri is going to track through Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York very slowly over the next three days. So let's just shrink this map here a little bit and go on uh, back. There we go. Uh, here's the radar. There it is, wrapping up very nicely. Big rains pushing into Illinois and Iowa, uh, eastern Kansas, into I Indiana, and then you know down the front all the way down to Georgia. What happens here is, okay, the low goes into Memphis. You can see that. Now, the two black lines, that's the occluded front. And we have the cold front west of Florida and the other one, the warm front, extending from the triple point. You see the big, thick black dot there in Georgia? That's the triple point where the warm front and the cold front meet. And that's the cold. That's, you often get a second low forming there. And uh, that and triple point is going to be a big deal. Now, the rain is still continuing here uh, early Friday morning across the Ohio Valley and spreading into North Carolina and Southern Virginia. Now, by midday Friday, the triple point has moved over, let's say, just east of Raleigh, something like that, maybe around Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. The main lows in you know, eastern Kentucky or southwest Virginia, and we have these very strong winds. You see the high north of Maine? So the interaction of the low, the triple point, and that high produces very strong winds and the heavy rain when it comes roaring through North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, oh, uh, a Thursday, Thursday night into Friday, depending on where you are. Uh, you know, it's going to be moving from south to north, so it'll occur at different times on Thursday, Thursday night, and Friday. Um, and you can see it pushes up and by uh, Friday night into this early Saturday, the heavy rains and the strong winds have pushed into Pennsylvania, Philly, New Jersey, New York City, New York State. And, of course, at that point, it has ended in most of Virginia. As you can see, it lifts north. You see how it lifts north? And then it's pushed, you know, it's ended by then. Now it's in New England and eastern Maine, but it's a much weaker system. And there's a new cold front coming in from the uh, uh, plains into the Midwest. Now the NAM is doing a very good job showing these powerful winds. So this is, uh, um, this is um, 1 o'clock on Friday morning. Now, these are maximum wind gusts, not sustained, maximum wind gusts. But the greens are winds, you know, over 35 miles an hour. And the orange are winds of 40 to 45 miles an hour. So that's early Friday morning, okay? You got that? Uh, uh, a 1 a.m. Friday morning. Now, here the winds really pick up. Now, at this point, the winds are not that strong in North Carolina. Raleigh has pretty good winds, Greensboro, uh, and moving into southwest Virginia. But now, as the triple point really begins to interact with that high to the north, the wind field really increases, and you can see widespread winds of 35 miles per hour or greater in eastern North Carolina, central and eastern Virginia, Washington, D.C., the northern Shenandoah Valley, the eastern portions of West Virginia, western Maryland, Baltimore, spreading into the Del Marva. This is 5 a.m. Friday morning. Now this is a Friday at uh, I guess that would be a, a one o'clock. And now the big winds have left Richmond and about to leave D.C. and Winchester. But you can still see very strong winds on the Chesapeake Bay, really howling up to 55 miles an hour in gusts, according to the NAM. Uh, 40 to 50 miles an hour across the entire Del Marva, Baltimore, Central Maryland. Most of central and southern Pennsylvania getting into Philly. This is now uh, eight. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, six p.m. on Friday. Look at these tremendous winds: Baltimore, Annapolis, uh, Salisbury, Dover, um, Georgetown, and the Delmarva. Let's not forget our friends there. They're going to get pounded by these winds because they're so open on the bay and on the ocean. And these are all southeast winds, east-southeast winds coming in from the ocean 
inland okay so that's how this winds are blowing these are not north winds these are east or southeast winds and then the high winds pushing into jersey and philadelphia into new york city allentown lancaster harrisburg gettysburg reading and then finally up by saturday morning it's now cleared new york city and the winds field is finally falling apart in new york state and southern new england uh, there's a slot. This one's out of position. You can see this is Friday evening at, uh, t at 10, 11 p.m. You can see these very strong winds off the coast of Jersey into New Jersey, Long Island, New York, Connecticut, eastern Pennsylvania, Philly all getting pounded, Allentown, Wilkesboro, Scranton. Winds gusting up to very strong. So it's the love. When the rain's coming down, it's going to storm. It's going to be now the GFS is showing the same sort of thing, not with the same intensity because the model resolution is not as high, but you can still see the same general idea that GFS is clearly showing the same idea here on Friday afternoon. <clears throat> OK, let's take a look at what's going on beyond this. Now, this here are these are our teleconnections. This is the Pacific side. We have the two teleconnections, the PNA, which is the West Coast Ridge and the EPO, which is Alaska. So we can see that the PNA here turns positive up until about uh, November 10th and then neutral by the middle of the month. Um, so that means a ridge on the west coast to some degree. And then the EPO turns negative here in early November and then it goes back to neutral. So we get a bit of an Alaska ridge, which means some cold air coming in from the Arctic region, but it doesn't last, that flow of the really, really cold air doesn't last too long. On the Atlantic side, both the AO and the NAO appear to stay close to neutral. But that's a little tricky, and I'll show you why. Uh, so, and that would apply, you know, ordinary November uh, pattern. Um, now, if we look at the actual data, the spread here, uh, we can see that there's a very strong, see the dark blue and the greens here? Those are negative numbers. So notice that as we go into November, we start seeing increasingly more negative Arctic oscillation as we head towards mid and late November on the GFS extended. This here is... Uh, the Eastern Pacific Oscillation. And again, notice in the second half of November, a lot of greens, dark greens and blues, which show increasingly negative EPO. That means an Alaskan ridge and a potentially Arctic cross polar flow, which implies a colder pattern. And then the uh, NAO also begins to go steadily negative, moderately so in the second half of November. All right. Let's take go beyond the current storm here and the teleconnections. Let's see what's happening. This is October 31, the upper air map. Notice the ridge on the west coast developing here. Okay, bringing the cold air in. A big trough coming in, pushing the uh, eastern U.S. storm out to sea finally. And if we look at it, we can see the service map. Here's our strong cold front, October 31. November 1, we have northwest winds across the Great Lakes, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the big Canadian high, 1030 millibars, fairly cold, fairly large, driving the cold air into the central and eastern U.S. at the beginning of November. This is November 3rd. Now, the front drops down to the south over Texas. Some rain develops there. The front stalls, but the cold air has overrun most of the country at this point. This here is the upper air map. Notice again, our block is back. There it is. Back in northern Canada, northwest Canada, it, the blocking will not go away. It's very, very strong so far here in the second half of autumn since the middle of October. And we have a nice big trough over the eastern United States. Look at our temperatures here. Now, this is going after this weekend into early next week, most of next week. Notice the cold air is fairly prominent. It's not severe cold, but it's definitely below normal. Now, the cold air is not quite reached into the southeastern states, but it does at some point after the front pushes through, the second front pushes through here. And then we can see uh, the trough. Uh, this is uh, this November 6th uh, pushes, we get, uh, amplifies very strongly. The block is back over eastern Canada, and we have this big closed upper low again over the Midwest, excuse me, over New England and New York State, and a deep trough here. We notice we have two upper lows, one in the Gulf of uh, uh, the Alaska and the other one over New York State and Pennsylvania. Now, the th what I want to point out in purple here is look at this in purple. You see I've highlighted this feature? Now, if you look at the Greenland, you'll see a big negative anomaly there. And we have the but we have a block over no northern Quebec. So what happens is that you're getting this you know conjunction of the strong negative and the strong positive which makes it neutral the NAO, but it's still technically a blocking pattern. So if you look at the NAO, you go, well it's neutral, it's not a big deal. That's not really true. It's a little deceptive here. 
So you got to keep that in mind. Now, what happens is eventually, if you go back in here a little bit, uh, this front develops low pressure on November 4th, and the front passes to the east, and we get this low pressure on the coast here, and we get snow, the first snow of the season potentially, showing up in the European and the GFS in central and northern Pennsylvania and in New York State. Look at the cold high here coming down over Kansas and Oklahoma, driving the cold air into the eastern U.S. and eventually into Texas and the Delta and eventually to the east coast. And you can see an enlargement here of what the European is showing. Uh, you can see the snow in, in, New York, in northern Pennsylvania, New York State, rain in Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland with the cold front. Now it pushes off the coast. We still have snow up towards Montreal and uh, Buffalo and Watertown, Messina, maybe Binghamton in the mountains there. And then the cold air behind that front finally surges heat. Look at the cold air. Look at these anomalies. You know, uh, 8, 9, 10 degrees below normal. Yeah, that's pretty cold stuff for the middle of November. Look at that. Not, not too shabby, Abby. The entire eastern half of the country and even to Texas and the southeastern states getting pretty cold here. This is the European showing the same sort of thing. A very, very good model agreement here. Look at that. I mean, that's really nice to see. Now, beyond that, this is now we go November 8th. Okay, so what happens is that trough is still on the east coast. We have the Gulf of Alaska trough pushing down all the way towards California, eastern Pacific, and the block is there in the central, north central Canada and Quebec. Now, again, look at Greenland. That's a negative anomaly. So you look at the chart of the NAO, you go, well, the positive and the negative anomalies are right next to each other, so they cancel each other out. So the graph shows you what appears to be a neutral NAO, but it's not really. So it's a little tricky in that regard. Now, as we go beyond it, let's look at the uh, GFS ensemble the next five days uh, out towards November 9th. Again, you can see the same sort of thing. We have a nice polar vortex, a moderate ridge in Western Canada, a moderate trough in, over the East Coast and the Gulf of Alaska. That's a fairly cold looking map. Even beyond this, now taking us to November 11th, in the middle of the month, the t below normal temperatures across the eastern third of the country pretty cold for the start of November. It has been a long time since we've had a cold November in the eastern half of the country. The European weeklies are showing the same sort of thing. So there's a lot of support for that. The GFS ensemble show the same sort of thing, the extended models there. All right, and beyond this here, this is the uh, GFS uh, for November 11th, November 13th. Both models to show blocking have energy coming in again from the west coast, which goes underneath the block. And there's some sort of activity trying to develop here for the middle of November over the Midwest and potentially the east coast. And then this is the uh, CFS extended. This takes us to November 25, which is Thanksgiving. Now, this is got this is really interesting. Now, of course, it's the CFS. It's not that reliable, but it's a very big ridge on the west coast of California. We have cross polar flow. You have a negative anomaly in the Tennessee Valley and the Gulf Coast. That's screaming low pressure development. This has some potential if this is right. Of course, it's the CFS, but still. Now, uh, of course, when you're dealing with models, you know, this far out, you want to have something else besides models to look at, something independent. And one of the things we can do here is look at the MJO. Now, the European is on the left. Here's the Australian. They keep it pretty much in phase one right through the middle of November. Um, and that's, you know, an ordinary November pattern here. But the extended MJO here from Kyle McRitchie shows that the MJO goes into phase three and four and five here in the middle and late November. And what does that mean? Well, in November, when you have La Nina and you're at MJO phase three, that's a fairly cold looking upper air map. You can see a strong ridge, that's what the black R means, on the west coast, a deep trough covering the Great Lakes, the Midwest, the deep south, the east coast, and potentially storminess going along, that, uh, along the coast there. And you have a ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You have some blocking in northern Canada, not a lot, but this is a fairly cold, active, stormy pattern uh, for the middle of November. If the MJO is in phase three, and if it goes into phase five, look at this. I mean, that's screaming major eastern U.S. winter storm uh, for late November, if that's right. A uh, big ridge on the west coast, strong art, uh, negative Arctic oscillation over the Arctic region here, blocking in Canada, a very powerful negative anomaly in the northeast quadrant of the country. That's screaming uh, major winter storm for late November. If, if 
the MJO goes into phase five in late November. We do not know if it's going to do that. This is speculation. This is an experimental model. But if it does that, that would support also the CFS argument of this type of event happening as well. So again, there is something indicating maybe around Thanksgiving something significant in the eastern U.S. That's all we can say at this point. We don't know any more than that. This is Meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. I like doing them. I like teaching a lot, showing you that it is possible to detect you know, potential significant events and trends beyond seven days without using, you know, just straight GFS computer gibberish. There's a lot of things to look at. There are a lot of clues out there. The extended models are getting better than they used to be. So maybe, you know, we can see what's going on here. And I'm pretty bullish about November and maybe December as well. I do not like the CPC extended for, uh, winter forecast here of a mild winter in the eastern U.S. I think that's bullshit. And uh, I think we're off to a pretty good start here. We'll see. This is meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I will see you over on the Facebook page, the website, and on the Twitter page.